So welcome everybody to Harrison Library's virtual talk on Lucille Ball with Evan Wiener. I am uh, going to turn this over to Evan, who's our seasoned lecturer here at the Harrison Library. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us this afternoon. And thank you, Giovanna. My name is Evan Wiener, and thank you for joining me this afternoon. My background is radio and TV, and uh, I give talks because I'm too old to be on TV now, so they tell me, uh, and radio, uh, because they're looking for 18 to 34 year olds, except in this case. Oh yeah, they're looking for 18 to 34 year olds. Uh, right now, wherever you are in the world, someone is watching the I Love Lucy show. And uh, Lucille Ball was an actress who did not want to be known for business, except she was the uh, most powerful business woman in Hollywood and one of the most powerful business women in the world in the 1950s, in the 1960s. But she didn't want to be known for that. She wanted to be known as a comedian, as an actress. She was uh, born in Jamestown, New York on August 6, 1911. And the genesis of this talk uh, was the Chester, New Jersey Library. Chester is in central New Jersey. I was doing an early days of TV talk, talking about Lucy, the businesswoman, and uh, Donella, who is uh, the uh, person who brings people in. Uh, to the library said, I got you penciled in for August 5th. This was in March of 2021. You're going to do a talk on Lucy because I know you could do it. I said, uh, I've been drafted. She said, pretty much so. So uh, we did this talk last year for Lucy's 110th birthday, and I've been doing a lot of talks in person with Lucy. Her father was a telephone lineman who died of typhoid fever in 1915. And that left Lucille, her mother Desiree, a brother, alone with Desiree's father and mother, Fred and Flora Bell Hunt. Fred Hunt in 1936 did something that nearly derailed Lucille Ball's career in 1953. She was the uh, most unlikely of uh, the Hollywood moguls. Uh, at 17, she left her upstate New York high school in Jamestown, New York, for Broadway. However, initially, everybody told her, you don't have it. Why don't you go home, have a nice life in Western New York? She went to um, acting school, and one of her classmates in acting school was somebody you might have heard of, I'm not sure, Betty Davis. Betty Davis was one of her uh, classmates. Uh, she would come up with the idea of Desi Lu Productions about two decades after being rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected. Uh, Lucy was not an overnight sensation. Oh, Desi Lu without uh, Desi. A Desi Lu production in association with Norway Corporation. That is Star Trek. Lucille Ball is the mother of Star Trek. But I'm getting ahead of myself right there. The executive, she rebuilt the studio, Desi Lu in the 1960s, was one of Hollywood's, or was Hollywood's most powerful businesswoman. 1962, she bought out Desi Arnaz to have complete control of her company. Uh, she was the first woman to own a major studio, and three of her shows went on to become successful movie franchises. Mission Impossible, Star Trek, and The Untouchables. Lucy was the only one who believed in Star Trek. But she becomes a, a model in New York. She tries to, uh, she comes to New York. She wants to trip the light fantastic. The roar of the grease paint, all that other stuff, but it's just not working out. But she becomes a model and uh, becomes a print model for among other things, Chesterfield cigarettes. Uh, to make ends meet in New York, she also becomes a nude model for uh, college students who uh, want to go into the arts and painting. And uh, she also turns some tricks. She uh, sells herself because she wants to feed herself in New York because nothing is happening on Broadway. Nothing is happening uh, in the movies uh, either for her. Uh, and she also gets rheumatoid arthritis while she's in New York. That's something my wife has. And I can tell you the joints all swell up and sometimes there's problems walking or just doing uh, simple things like uh, writing your name some days. Um, she goes on to Hollywood as a golden girl, gold wind girl, 1933. 
she got a part in Roman Scandals, which starred Eddie Cantor at his height. That was his absolute height. Joe Franklin's favorite performer, Eddie Cantor. Lincoln Whoopi was a big hit around there. Uh, in an effort to survive in Hollywood, Lucille Ball becomes a stunt girl. She figures, I'll become a stunt girl, which is remarkable considering she had rheumatoid arthritis. Now, that's my wife, and that's Humphrey Bogart's mistress. Her name is Verita Thompson. She was runner-up Miss Arizona around 1937-1938. Uh, pictures of her when she was a lot younger. She was friends with Coco Chanel, so she had the Coco Chanel uh, outfits. And, uh, and, and there are, of course, the little uh, busts of uh, Humphrey Bogart. Um, but she was a stunt girl, too. And one day, uh, she passed away about uh, 12, 13 years ago. She was going to live to 120 and then uh, die and then tell everybody down there what life was like until 120. She didn't get there. But anyway, uh, she was a stunt girl. And we were talking one day, and I said, uh, Marita, you were a stunt girl. What exactly did a stunt girl do? Well, they fell off horses. She fell off horses. She jumped out of burning buildings. She rolled in the dirt. Uh, she risked her body. Uh, that's what a stunt girl does. She only lasted about a year. And I'm not going to repeat what she said or the quote that's attributed to her, but it's a quote that has one of those golden words in there that George Carlin said you can't use. So di doctors diagnosed Lucille Ball with rheumatoid arthritis when she was 17 years, in 19, 17 years old in 1928 which made her slapstick comedy with pratfalls even more difficult. She finds a fan in Hollywood, somebody who takes a look and says, hey, wait a minute, this woman has some talent. His name is Buster Keaton, and he was one of the stars of the uh, silent age of uh, Hollywood, pantomime, and doing stunts, and never speaking. And he continued doing that until the 1950s and 60s, uh, there's uh, up on YouTube, if you look up Buster Keaton, you'll find a, a beer commercial that he did uh, in the 50s or 60s where he's doing the stunts that he did 40 years earlier. Uh, physical comedy. Buster Keaton saw a comedic promise in Lucy, helped her hone her timing and the ability to use props for laughs. He even demonstrated to her how to perform physical comedy without getting hurt. And then he calls Harry Cohn at Columbia Pictures. Hey, Harry, I got a girl for you. Her name's Lucille Ball. I think she's going to be a star. You know what? Why don't you take a look? Take a look. Take a look. You know, all right. All right, Buster. If you say so, I'll take a look. Uh, Columbia Pictures produced Three Stooges Shorts, the two reelers. And there she is, towering over Curly, Moe, and Larry there. She is, makes her first comedic appearance on film with the Three Stooges uh, in a short called Three Little Pigskins. She landed a contract with Columbia Pictures, and uh, that was her first serial, or first short. Uh, and it would be her first venture into the world of comedy. She would always credit the Stooges uh, with introducing her to slapstick and physical comedy. But uh, Harry Cohn wasn't all that impressed. In fact, uh, he wasn't impressed at all. And he thought she didn't have any talent, and that was the end of Lucy over at Columbia Pictures. But somehow along the way, she befriends Ginger Rogers. And Ginger Rogers' mother was sort of a den mother for all of these starlets. Now, this is 1937, and uh, Lucy probably isn't considered a starlet by this point. After all, she's already uh, 26 years old. And there are much younger people coming through Hollywood. But she becomes friends with Ginger Rogers and Ginger Rogers' mother. And Ginger Rogers' mother had advice for people like Lucy and others, other girls, sleep with the boss. You might get ahead if you sleep with the boss. And there are biographies about Lucy, and even Desi said it uh, as well, about uh, Lucy's uh, time in Hollywood trying to get ahead. Gregory LeCava cast a brown hair at Lucille Ball to play Roger's dancing partner in Stage Door, which starred Catherine Hepburn, Ann Miller, and Eve Arden. By the way, Desi would go on to produce the Mother-in-Law, the Mothers-in-Law show with Eve Arden and uh, Kate Ballard in the mid-1960s. 
Uh, the movie was RKO's big effort of the year. Hit at the box office. It does nothing for Lucy's career. She's also in a movie called Room Service with the Marx Brothers, Groucho, Chico, and Harpo. Not one of the more memorable Marx Brothers movies, uh, not up there certainly with Duck Soup or Horse Feathers or Night at the Opera or even Day of the Races. Uh, but uh, there she is. She's uh, there with uh, the Marx Brothers. Tell them Groucho sent you. That would be in 1938 where she would appear with the brothers. She struggled for many years in Hollywood uh, during the early years of her career. She appeared in everything from hard-boiled drama films to romantic comedies throughout the 30s and 40s. And eventually she gets this nickname, Queen of the B Pictures. Not exactly a nickname you want to carry around, but anyway, she did. 1940 things change. Desi meets Lucy. And Lucy gets some critical acclaim on the big screen. Now, Desi's story is kind of interesting. He's a Cuban exile. He uh, comes to America in 1933 at the age of 16. Why is he in exile? Well, his father was a politician. His family had money connected to the rum company, which had to eventually flee. And they were on the wrong side of the 1933 Sergeant's Revolt led by uh, Fulgencio uh, Batista, who had become the dictator of Cuba in the 1950s. And they fled with just the shirts on their back. They ended up in Miami Beach. He goes to school at St. Leo's University in Tampa. And along the way, Xavier Cougat finds him. And he is uh, Cougie's uh, protege. And uh, he's on Broadway in 1939. And he goes west to see if he could do anything in the movies. And he has a band as well. Uh, Lucy was in a 1940s film called Dance Girl Dance, where she played the role of Bubbles and got some notice. And that year, she appeared in Too Many Girls, which was Desi's show on Broadway, alongside Desi Arnaz, which is kind of ironic because uh, in uh, Desi and Lucy's life together, there seems to have been too many girls. Uh, they elope. November 1940, legally get married in California, legally get married. That's an important thing to underline here. And it comes back 10 years later as to why there's an explanation point about it. With uh, Lucy Chauvin's schedule and Desi constantly on tour with his band, the newlyweds uh, seldom saw each other. And she files for divorce uh, from Desi in 1944 because there are rumors that he's drinking and there's a lot of infidelity. Uh, but soon they uh, reconcile. Uh, meanwhile, she's uh, hit in the B movies. The B, I used to work at the drive in movie uh, in Rockland County in 1974 when I was 18 years old. And uh, when uh, I worked in the, the drive in movie, there was always a middle movie, uh, which was an okay movie, but certainly wasn't the A movie. And, um, the B movies were important back in the 1930s, 1940s, when people went to the movie theater because they expected a full day of entertainment, whether it was uh, cartoons for the kids, uh, travel shorts, uh, the newsreels, uh, the serials, the A picture, and then the B picture. So you had a whole day at the movies. Uh, and she was the queen of the B movies. Here she is uh, in the Fuller Brush Girl, starring Lucille Ball and Eddie Albert. Uh, they had more in common than just the Fuller Brush Girl in the 1950s because they were, well, we'll get to that in a few minutes. In the 1940s, Lucy starred in a string of several feature length comedies, including, uh, this is an unfortunate one too, uh, Her Husband's Affairs. Miss Grant Takes Richmond with William Holden. Verita not only was uh, Humphrey Bogart's uh, mistress, but also did some time with uh, William Holden and Jimmy Cagney. Uh, the Fuller Brush Girl with Eddie Albert in two Bob Hope movies, Sorrowful Jones and Fancy Dance. So here's the question. You can put this in, uh, in, in the chat if you want. Uh, did television kill the radio star? Yes or no? Did television kill the radio star? If you want to answer it, I'll give you about 15 seconds before I go on. And by the way, uh, about radio. Radio, you didn't have to memorize lines. You read the lines uh, right off the script. Uh, the real actors in, uh, or actresses in radio were the effects people. Walking up the steps and 
all that other stuff. Uh, so anyway, did television kill the radio star, yes or no? Well, here's the answer. My favorite husband. My favorite husband was first broadcast as a one-time special on CBS radio, July 5th, 1948. Uh, and the fact that Lucy found something at the age of 37, or almost 37, a month short of her 37th birthday, was both a fluke and quite remarkable. Yeah, she was on radio, she was in these but the movies, but nothing, really nothing. CBS uh, had a new series coming out called Armis Brooks, but it didn't come to uh, air on July 5th. It wasn't ready. They had recorded this thing, uh, My Favorite Husband. It was a pilot show, an audition show, uh, and CBS says, okay, Let's throw it on because the worst thing that could happen is that uh, nobody listened and it was a half hour that nobody will ever remember. But my favorite husband actually is pretty good. Uh, Lucille Ball and Lee Bowman played the characters of Liz and George Pugat. It would be changed to Cooper. Pugat. I don't know, was it an ode to Coogan? Desi's uh, mentor? And the private uh, and the positive response to this broadcast convinced CBS to launch My Favorite Husband as a series. Now, Bowman was not available to do the series. After all, he was just doing a, an audition, a pilot show, you know, no commitment. Uh, but when it uh, debuts later that month in July of 1948, Lucille Ball and Richard Denning are the leads. Oh, look at that hair. Look at that hair. 1948, she's 37 years old and certainly not a starlet. There is uh, Denning, the co-star. My favorite husband featured Lucille Ball opposite Denning. The radio show was written by uh, Jess Oppenheimer, Madeline Pugh, and Bob Carroll Jr. The writers would be uh, integral to Lucy's radio success and all would make the jump to TV in 1950 except Denning. The radio show becomes I Love Lucy, My Favorite Husband, two people who live together and like it. My Favorite Husband was the first radio series to star, motion picture, musical comedy performer. She's a performer, not a star. Lucille Ball, her co-host on the CBS comedy show was Richard Denning. Ball and Denning were Liz and George Cooper, a happy couple who would get themselves into all kinds of domestic scraps. It was sort of a forerunner of the I Love Lucy show being written by Jess Oppenheimer, Madeline Pugh, and Bob Carroll Jr., who would do the Lucy shows. And they had best friends, the, the Atterbury's, Gail Gordon and B. Benedette Red. Um, and uh, they would be sponsored by Jell-O, General Foods, on radio, uh, Sanka, Jell-O, and this comes in, this becomes quite interesting in 1950. When that goes to TV. Music by Wilbur Hatch. When you had a radio show back in those days, um, they had a live band, and after the show was done, you went up on the dance floor and you danced. Same thing happened on the TV show. 1950, CBS approaches Lucy about doing a weekly program on television, and she jumped at the chance. After all, she was at this point almost 39. Uh, her first major requirement for any show becomes a major sticking point. Lucy doesn't have much leverage. She was a yeah, B movie performer. She was a performer on radio. And yeah, she's had success over the last two years on the radio show, but it's becoming quite apparent that radio is not the place to be anymore. After all, Ed Sullivan's a hit on TV, uh, and Milton Burl's a hit on TV, and they are famous for being on TV, even though uh, the audience on TV, 25% of the t potential TV audience, was in New York alone in those days. And there were just a few stations on the other side of Mississippi, whereas radio was still in the 48 states plus the Alaska and Hawaiian Territory and up in Canada. But Lucy, with very little leverage other than that hit show on radio, uh, used it. Uh, her first requirement for any show was her real life husband, Desi Arnaz, a Cuban, would play her husband on TV, possibly to save their marriage. CBS executives said, no way, no way, absolutely no way, not going to happen. CBS General Food slash Jell-O, the potential sponsor, thought the American public would never accept Desi as the husband of a red-blooded American girl from Jamestown, New York. 
CBS and Jello both insisted that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, the radio co-star, Richard Dennis, should continue as a co-star. Jello gets out. General Foods gets out. Philip Morris replaces them. Lucy wanted to save her marriage, hence working with Desi. And they were married. They were legally married. They were legally married. Lucy told CBS that they'd have to have both of them or neither. And eventually CBS conceded, even though the network had its doubts since Desi was Cuban and had a strong Cuban accent. Oh, but here's the real problem. Desi and Lucy were an interracial or multi-ethnic and that was not flying in 1950. So you gotta go back 73 years to understand why it wasn't flying in 1950. Rutherford B. Hayes was the president of the United States from 1877 to 1881. He was a Republican from Ohio. And yes, Desi and Lucy were legally married in California in 1940. Uh, interracial marriage in 1950, illegal in 17 states. Uh, America's civil rights movement was stalled since 1875. The segregation was in the South, ended with the uh, Hayes Samuel J. Tilden presidential race in 1876. To this day, nobody knows who really won that race. Uh, Hayes becomes president after the Democrats, mostly the Southern De Democrats, cut a deal with the Republicans. Democrats tell the Republicans, get the federal troops out of Louisiana. Get them out of South Carolina. Give us states' rights. Give us home rule. If you do that, if you do that, you could have the Oval Office. The deal was cut. Uh, one of the casualties, interracial marriage. It was illegal at that point in more than a dozen states. So Lucy and Desi go on tour. It's 1950. That's the Cuban Pete uh, routine that uh, they're doing there. And uh, they go out to prove that, yeah, you can believe us. We're husband and wife. We're believable, aren't we? Aren't we? Aren't we? Uh, and they would uh, make the audience say, hey, they're believable. They're good together. No problems with them. And nobody cared that they were an interracial couple. Absolutely nobody cared. Early in 1951, they produced an audition or film pilot for the series, which would become I Love Lucy. But uh, a little different than, than most of these pilots. They put up the money, not the network, for the show. And that meant they get to keep the show. CBS said yes. The radio show ended. The television star killed the radio star. Which reminds me that yesterday was MTV's 41st anniversary. And the first uh, video ever played on MTV was did television kill a radio star. In this case, it did. Lucy wanted to uh, film before a live audience. Now we're going to talk about the business side. Neither Lucy nor Desi went to Wharton. They, neither Lucy or Desi went to Yale or Harvard or Stanford business schools. Uh, this was all out of the school of hard knocks. Uh, so Lucy has demands. Film before a live audience. She wants Carl Frund to be the cinematographer for the new show. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's the way it is in TV, live audience. Okay, no, no problem. Oh, problem. She wants the show to be done from her home in Los Angeles. She's not going to New York. She's not going to Chicago, even though New York and Chicago were TV centers in 1951. Network said, hey, wait a minute. No, 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 no. You got to do those shows in those places. She said, no, um, the early days of TV, um, you might watch a PBS fundraiser today. It might be an old Sullivan show, whatever it was from the 50s. They had something that they called Kinescope, where they put a camera in front of a TV screen and just filmed it and then cycled it out to stations because you couldn't really do much else. But 1951, 1952, AT&T, uh, developed lines and um, you were able to transmit shows over lines. Uh, but this show is a little different. Uh, I Love Lucy was one of the pioneering shows for the use of multiple simultaneously filming cameras and a live studio audience. It was one of the first shows to be shot on 35 millimeter film rather than broadcast live. And that is why you're able to watch it today in what is pretty much a pristine picture. Tom Groucho sent you. Oh, Groucho, John Goodell, 
uh, and was one of the first people to use the multiple cameras on the Groucho Show, which premiered the year before Lucy. Technically, it's called You Bet Your Life and Sentiment, the best second banana ever on TV. Uh, other shows that were filmed that, that way included your Showtime, the Stu Irwin Show, and The Life of Riley. A guy by the name of Jerry Fairbanks developed and was using multiple camera film production for television in 1950. You bet your life. Groucho, with the dot and Fetterman, used a multiple camera film setup before a live studio audience the year before. Lucy also knew talent. Uh, I'm going to stop right here for a second, and you can answer this way, whatever way you want. It's either a yes or no. How many of you watch Jeopardy? Yes or no? I'm going to tell you this story to show you how much Lucy knew town. After all, she'd been banging around forever and ever and ever. 1983, Merv Griffin and Lucy have lunch out in Beverly Hills. And uh, Merv is telling Lucy uh, that he's going to bring back Jeopardy. And that uh, Art Fleming has said no. He did it uh, on NBC. He did it the nighttime show, all the versions that they did. Art Fleming did it. He has not wanted to do it anymore. After all, it's 19 years later. Uh, by the way, Art Fleming had been an actor on the Western when we found him. But, uh, so he's having lunch with Lucy. And he says, yeah, I want to bring this back. I just don't know. I just don't know. Who should I, who should I, really, who should I have on the show? And he, and without skipping a beat, she says, Alex Trebek. Now you know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey might say. Desi was the perfect foil for Lucy. He had good comedic timing. Expressive face offered just the right amount of fluster as the husband, Ricky. Uh, he mispronounced and Latinized words, which added to the comedy. Lucy, explain. Within four months of its debut, I Love Lucy was the number one show in New York, and the national audience soon followed. It's a smash hit. It should go on for five, six, seven years until the writers run out of ideas or the actors get tired of playing the same role. And back in those days, it was 39 weeks a year, not 22, which is network TV. Or if you look at Netflix and those other, I was involved with a possible Netflix uh, uh, project. And we were going to do six shows a year and I kind of disappeared. But my name's on the masthead anyway. That we were going to do this show for Netflix only six times a year over a four year period to get 24 shows. But uh, they have 39 shows to do, and it's a smash hit. It's colossal. People love I Love Lucy. But there wasn't much of an audience in 1951 uh, and 52 because in 1948, the Federal Communications Commission froze licenses. But they thawed them in 1952. And that would help out I Love Lucy. But before we even get to the thaw, there's a major, major, major problem that nearly kills the show after the first year. Oh, CBS, they love it. They have a smash hit. And they also love the fact that Lucy and Desi agreed to pay for the increase in production costs provided they, not CBS, own the rights to the film. This would turn out to be an absolutely brilliant business move because no one at the time thought anyone would ever watch a rerun. Why would you watch a rerun? You, never want, you don't want to see a show a second or third or fourth time. The deal, Desi and Lucy received ownership rights to I Love Lucy in exchange for a $1,000 weekly salary pay cut. But she gets pregnant. And that pregnancy nearly kills I Love Lucy. Uh, Lucy and Desi. Almost end, I Love Lucy, after they found out she was going to have a second baby. It's 1952. In 1952 America, it was considered too racy for a visibly pregnant woman to be on TV. Television, after all, had censorship. John Cameron Swayze's camera, uh, ca Camel Caravan of News, uh, you couldn't show no smoking signs. The only guy who was allowed to have a uh, cigar was Winston Churchill, and they censored news from North Korea and the Korean War. Lots of censorship going on. And Lucy and Desi were not allowed to say the word pregnant, although I was doing a talk for Rice Seniors uh, in, the, in the spring, and uh, there was a woman who was bilingual, and she said, oh, no, he said pregnant in Spanish. Censors didn't know Spanish. Uh, so anyway, they were not allowed to say pregnant. Also, there was no such thing as a pregnant woman on TV, the movies. 
visibly pregnant TV, movies, or Broadway. Jess Oppenheimer comes to the rescue. He's the show runner, he is the uh, producer, and uh, he's the lead writer. And that's, uh, you can see uh, Desi's expressive faces. Lucy looks adoringly at Jess and Jess at her. And this is a uh, breakup party for the season, uh, so long until August. Uh, so he has an idea. He suggests writing uh, Lucy's pregnancy into the show. Now, a visibly pregnant woman had never appeared on stage or television before, so this is a big risk for all concerned. Lucy and Desi and Oppenheimer from the creative end, CBS and the show sponsor, Philip Morris. Uh, except there was somebody who was pregnant on TV, except nobody really ever saw her because she's on the Dumont Network and Dumont had like nine viewers, literally nine viewers. I guess they had Channel 5, WABD in New York, and they had a station in Pittsburgh, but literally nobody saw the Dumont TV network back in 1948. But Mary Kay Sturge was pregnant, uh, and she slept in the same bed as her husband, and she had the kid who was part of the show in 1949. TV had some weird things. Like, you were a married couple like Desi and Lucy. Uh, you couldn't sleep together in the same bed. Even if you were married in real life, you had to have twin beds. And even with twin beds, if you sat on it, you had to have one foot on the bed and one foot on the floor. Why? Who knows? That was the way it was in the 1950s. Storyline would work. CBS allowed Lucy to appear on screen during her pregnancy, and some scripts did address the topic. However, CBS said, man, nah, don't go too heavy on this. Don't go too heavy on it because we don't want to court. It's too much of a story because it's kind of racy to be pregnant on TV in 1952. But Lucy and Desi would survive. And, you know, and according to Lucy, and you might have this book in the library, this is her autobiography. In early fall, when I was beginning to look pretty big, we did seven shows concerning my pregnancy. These films were screened by a priest, a minister, and a rabbi for any possible violation of good taste. It was the CBS network that objected to using the word pregnant. They made us say expecting. So a priest, the minister, and the rabbi, they walk into a room to watch a show. The three-man religious committee had not protest. What's wrong with pregnant? According to Lucy, they were hardly in favor of what we were doing, showing motherhood as a happy, wholesome, normal family event. Hey, I Love Lucy survives a rocky pregnancy, the show getting on the air, and survives a pregnancy. Nothing could go wrong. This thing should last to 57, 58, 59 without any problems. You know, just keep cranking out the shows, cranking out the shows. Oh, the pregnancy. There's a, an unusual picture. Lucy is wearing pants. In the 1950s, women could not wear pants on TV. Mary Tyler Moore wore pants the first season of the Dick Van Dyke Show in the CBS People. This is 1960, 61. CBS told Carl Reiner, put her in a skirt. She looks too good in, in pants. She said no. Uh, and Carl Reiner eventually said no, and she wore capri pants. Uh, TV had some strange rules back then. Uh, during uh, the second season of I Love Lucy, when she was pregnant, she couldn't do the entire 39 episode production schedule, so she'd miss a program here and there. In fact, she would miss the programs after she gave birth. Uh, at that point, she just showed the program once, and that created a problem. But Desi and Jess Oppenheimer come up with an unusual idea. We broadcast some of the episodes from the first season. That's okay, because there were over 100 new TV stations on in 1952, and many people who did not see the show in 1951 could see the show in 1952 with the new stations. The reruns were rating winners, and that opens up a whole new area for television. It's called syndication. Sell the show for a second or third, or in this case, 18,000 times uh, viewed by somebody. Uh, again, another idea, School of Hard Knocks, out of necessity. Desi Lu Studios went on to invent the concept of the rerun, used the profits from the I Love Lucy show syndication to fund the growth of the Desi Lu studio. Uh, Lucy and Desi were television's first millionaires. Oh, about the pregnancy. That uh, show airs on January 19, 1953. 
It's January 20th, 1953, Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States, swearing in Dwight Eisenhower as uh, Herbert Hoover, who was president in 1928. And, uh, there's Dick Nixon, uh, who's now the, the vice president. Uh, I, I dealt with Dick starting in 1985. Uh, and there's Dick Nixon. That's a long story how I got involved with him. But I do my 1985 talk, I explain how I got involved with him. Uh, for about four or five years. Anyway, uh, who, which episode got more viewers? Well, you know, some it's like apples and oranges because Lucy was on Monday night, at nine o'clock. Eisenhower was on noon on Tuesday. But the episode in which Lucy gives birth to Little Ricky aired the day before Eisenhower's inauguration. January 19th, 1953, drew substantially more viewers than his swearing in. 44 million Americans watched Lucy give birth to Little Ricky. I got 15 million less viewers. But uh, uh, another problem, another problem. So they overcome uh, interracial marriage, overcome the pregnancy, but this one could kill Lucy's career. Registered Red in 1936, Lucille Star denies she voted comedy. There was Walter Winchell and others screaming and yelling that she voted communist in 1936, middle of the Red Square, uh, scare, McCarthy era. Uh, and there it is, the affidavit of registration. I intend to affiliate at the ensuing primary election with the Communist Party, Miss Lucille D. Ball, 1936. They got her dead to rights, got her dead to rights. So she's going to have to go before the House on Un-American Activities to explain herself away. Americans, don't patronize Red. You can drive the Reds on television, radio, and Hollywood. This track will tell you how. Why we must drive them out. The Reds have made our screen, radio, and TV Moscow's most effective fifth column in America. The Reds of Hollywood and Broadway have always been the chief financial support of communist propaganda in America. Our own films made by red producers directors writers and stars are being used by moscow in asia africa the balkans and throughout europe to create hatred of america right now films are being made to craftily glorify marxism see i was under the impression that those glorified films starred groucho chico and harpo and maybe zeppo back in the 1930s i didn't know they were being made in the 1950s uh well, I guess they were talking about Karl Marx and Engels. Well, whatever. Marxism, UNESCO, and One World is a via your TV set. They're being piped into your living room and are poisoning the minds of your children under your very eyes. So remember, if you patronize a film made by red producers, writers, and stars and studios, you are eating and abetting communism. Every time you permit reds to come into your living room via your TV set, you are helping Moscow. And the internationalists destroy America. The bike list involved the practice of denying employment to entertainment industry professionals believed to be or have been communists or sympathizers, not just actors, but screenwriters, Dalton Trumbo, directors, musicians, uh, Leonard Bernstein, Pete Seeger, and other American entertainment professionals, and even Helen Keller were barred from work by the studios. She was barred from work. She was the original Alice Cramden, Cavalcade of Stars on Dumont, the Jackie Gleason Show, The Honeymooners, Sketches. Kurt Kelton was the original Alice Cramden, but uh, she was a communist. And they got Gleason and the producers in Dumont got rid of her. Um, and she was replaced by Audrey Meadows. Uh, they never acknowledged she was blacklisted. Gleason and the producers explained that her departure was based on Heart problems, heart problems. Hazel Scott, darling of the Cafe Society, never was a communist, never a communist sympathizer. She's married to the uh, congressman, Adam Clayton Powell at the time. She was the first African-American or person of color, a woman, uh, to host a network TV show on Dumont 1950. Um, and uh, her show starts on September 29th, 1950, rather July 3rd. Uh, 1950 and September 29th, 1950. She's named in the Red Channels as a sympathizer on June 22nd, 1950. On September 22nd, she chose to testify before the House on Un American Activities to defend herself. 
sponsors of Dumont drop the show a week later. Philip Loeb, co-star of the Goldbergs, the highly successful radio show that was highly successful on TV starting in 1949. In 1955, the actor Philip Loeb checked himself into the Taft Hotel in Midtown Manhattan under a false name, took a fatal dose of sleeping pills. Loeb was accused of being a communist and could no longer find work. Six years earlier, he was the co-star of one of TV's first situation comedies, The Goldbergs, created by Gertrude Brown. Joe McCarthy, McCarthyism, The Fight for America by the Wisconsin Republican Senator Joe McCarthy and blackballing. Um, and McCarthy never gave evidence of communists. He just yelled and screamed and yelled and screamed and yelled and screamed, but never came up with one part carrying communist. It's September 4th, 1953. Lucille Ball gives voluntary testimony to an investigator for the House on Un-American Activities. She decides to throw her grandfather under the bus. Because our grandfather, Fred Hunt, he just wanted us to, and I we just did something that's poison. Didn't intend to vote that way. As I recall, I didn't. The FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, and maybe Clyde Tolson too, uh, was a big fan of I Love Lucy. Watched it all the time. And that may have saved Lucy from being blacklisted. That, the fact that she was making scandalous amounts of money that William Paley at CBS never could imagine, or Philip Morris, thanks to the show. She was worth a fortune of money because of her business and Desi's business acumen. Lucille Ball swore to the House Committee she never knowingly aided the Communist Party aside from placating her grandfather's many requests for room in the garage to organize with her friends. In her autobiography, Lucille observed in herself a strong conservative Puritan streak and claimed I'm the most conservative member of my family. It was for her grandfather, a progressive and a free thinker, that she registered as a communist. I look at this picture, this is 1953, and I often think, what exactly is Desi thinking about? Is he thinking about fleeing Cuba in 1933, 20 years earlier? Lucy's having a news conference, uh, complete with cigarette and drink in her hand, and talking about the testimony. Uh, Desi was uh, the uh, studio audience uh, warm up act. Uh, if you have ever gone to a TV show, they usually have a comedian who says, uh, you know, uh, if, you know, if in case of fire, uh, that's the exit, that's the exit, that's the exit, tells a few jokes and all that other stuff. They expected the crowd to boo Lucy when she comes out before the filming of episode 68 of I Love Lucy called The Girls Go Into Business, and he addresses the accusation. Uh, he reuses the line in Lucy's friend, Heather Hopper's gossip column. The only thing read about Lucy is her hair. And even that's not legitimate. See, it wasn't legitimate. Radio star, TV killed the radio star, right? CBS microphone. Shortly after she signs with MGM in the early 1940s, the studio hairstylist, Sidney Gilleroff, changed her hair from brown to red. The 1943 film, The Barry Was a Lady, debuted her hair to movie audiences and earned her the nickname Technicolor Tessie probably wasn't a glowing nickname. No, she was not a natural redhead. I worked for a guy named Sully Adler back in 1978, 79. I was 22, 23 years old, cutting my teeth in the business. And instead of being in a mail room, I was out there covering things in 1978, which led me to WNW Radio. I was doing radio and newspapers in, uh, in March 1978 when I was 21 years old. Uh, John Lindsay came to Rockland County to uh, the Tappan townhouse. It was a Democratic function that day, a fundraiser. All the major Democrats of that day were there. Uh, uh, Hugh Carey, Patrick Moynihan, um, uh, Mario Cuomo with his two kids, Andrew and uh, Chris, and his wife, Matilda, uh, Gerald Nadler. Um, and Lindsay walks in, and uh, he's half drunk, and he comes right up to me, and he says, I like you. I want to tell you something. And I said, what's that? I'm going to run for Senate, 1980. Well, hey, I got my scoop, biggest scoop in New York State that day. I'm just 21. Run back to my radio station, reported, UPI and AP. Get a call from WNEW Radio. Henry Marcotte said, we want you to do that story for us. How much are you going to pay? Ten bucks sold. 
I was on WNEW uh, for three years, the home of Julius La Rosa. Anyway, so I worked for this guy, Selig Adler, uh, who comes out of the Confidential Magazine. And um, these were all part-time jobs. Uh, after all, I'm only 22. And uh, I'm covering an East Ramapo school board, which is like the lowest of the low that you can cover in terms of, uh, of, of stories. And uh, this school board. Anyway, the, the uh, president of the school board was a concentration camp victim, survivor, George F. Hyde. And I wrote my story, and he says to me, uh, how was she dressed? I said, I don't know. I didn't. I don't remember. She's in her 50s, you know, I'm in my 20s. Concentration camps about her. Well, was she wearing a low-cut uh, uh, V-neck? I don't know. Was she wearing heels? I don't know. Unfortunately, he got fired a couple of weeks later for me because I couldn't write that stuff. But he comes out of the confidential world. And uh, so I, I gave you the background because of Confidential Magazine. Desi Arnaz was cheating on his wife, Lucille Ball, according to Confidential in 1955. Lou Desi was inviting me for more than a drink, said the day. This is a story from the 1940s, 1944, when indeed Arnaz and Ball were separated. Oh, the babe quoted was a prostitute on Confidential's payroll. It was both safe and lucrative to run a story entitled, Does Desi Really Love Lucy? It was a tough gig. She caught colds, hit crying spells, broke two fingers, sprained her ankle three times, pulled the tendon, sweated off 19 pounds, came down with a virus, went on hiatus, recovered at the beach. She fainted on stage. She fainted on stage another time. The production crew set up an oxygen tank for her in the wings. She fainted again. By 1956, Desi and Lucy had had it, absolutely had it. You know, after all, getting the show on was a struggle. The show nearly dies because of pregnancy. She's accused of being a communist. And there's also the Confidential Magazine, which in retrospect was the least of her concerns. But it's getting weary. And also, the uh, writers are running out of ideas. But the business side of I Love Lucy kicks in. Uh, they decide, we, we don't have a syndication arm. We just have a studio. They sell the I Love Lucy shows back to CBS for $5 billion. About $65 billion say in 1957. Seinfeld sold for about a quarter of a billion dollars in syndication. And the rerun industry was born. With that money, Desi and Lucy would purchase the uh, studio lot, RKO studio lot, which she failed in 1937 in the movie. Uh, uh, but here she owns it now. And they would film other shows, filmed in Hollywood, uh, in Culver City. Uh, the lot would serve as outdoor settings for the Andy Griffith show, Make Room for Daddy, Mission Impossible, Hogan's Heroes, Batman, Star Trek, and That Girl, and a whole lot more. Uh, oh, whatever happened to My Favorite Husband? Well, Lucy's back with My Favorite Husband in an uh, indirect, direct way. This thing would return to TV in 1953. Uh, it would star Joan Caulfield and Barry Nelson as Liz and George Cooper. Uh, it runs for two and a half years. The first two years, it's produced live at CBS Television City, uh, next to the Grove by the Farmer's Market. I'm in L.A. We always go to the Grove. My friend takes me there, and I always say, hey, look it over there. It's where Bob Barker's studio is, and it is. It's where Price is Right is uh, taped, along with uh, Let's Make a Deal, the Corden Show, and some soap operas. Um, the studio, they left the studio to go to Desi Lou for the third season. It was only half a season. Uh, and it was filmed at Desi Lou, which meant that Lucy was making money off of her original show that led her to stardom and TV. There would be an occasional show starring in 1957 because Desi and Lucy turned down the half hour sitcom format. Uh, they were offered $80,000 a show, altogether about $3.5 million for the season of 39 shows and 13 repeats, they had had enough. They, their health was not good. But Desi Lou does strike a deal with Ford uh, to produce five Lucy and Desi specials over the next few years. Uh, Ford was spending money like crazy in those days because they were trying to promote the Edsel. Uh, so they give them $2.5 million for five shows. Uh, Desi also has some health problems. And uh, at this point, what Desi's what, 30, 40 years old. 40 years old at this point. They do have other shows on, the Ann Southern show, uh, The Untouchables. 
And Lucy was uh, primarily responsible or partially responsible, more primarily responsible for moving most of American television production from New York to Los Angeles. What was left in New York, they had Sullivan Show, the Jack Parr Show, uh, the news shows, um, and uh, some quiz shows uh, or game shows. And that was it. Most of the uh, primetime shows were now done out of Hollywood, and a number of them done at the Desi Lou Studios. Including this one, the Westinghouse Desi Lou Playhouse. And that ran on what was then called the Columbia Broadcasting System from uh, 58 to 60. Three of its 48 episodes served as pilots for TV shows. The Twilight Zone with Rod Shore in one episode, and The Untouchables two episodes. Lucy makes her quote-unquote producer debut, although she was the producer, with a 1959 episode of the Westinghouse Desi Lou Playhouse. Lucy knew talent. No doubt she knew talent. It's another guy that she believed in, Rod Serling. Rod Serling wrote The Time Element, which starred William Bendix. Sterling, a Serling show got positive reviews, and uh, CBS and Serling got together. They bypassed Desi Lu, and CBS gave him the go-ahead for a science uh, fiction fantasy anthology series called The Twilight Zone, which debuted in the fall of 1959 and lasted four years. These are the untouchables. Um, there's Robert Stack, third from the left. I had a night out with Robert Stack. I hung out with him at a baseball game. Gave as much personality as Elliot Ness. And uh, my friend Jim Gannon, the late Jim Gannon, who was on Mutual Radio, came from Chicago, actually knew people who knew Ness. And they said the untouchables starring Elliot Ness was a compilation of a lot of people. And Elliot Ness did not do what he claimed he did. Uh, anyway, the Desi Lu Playhouse, they have a two-part drama called The Untouchables. Paul Monish uh, adapted the 1957 Memories of the Treasury Agent, Elliot Ness, played by Robert Stack. CBS passed on the show. It became a hit series for ABC for four years until Jack Webb ruined the show. Uh, but that's part of the history of TV. The split came in 1960. She filed for divorce, charging Desi with extreme cruelty and she uh, was suffering from or, or subjected to grievous mental suffering. I've tried so hard to be fair and solve our problems, but now I find it impossible to go on. Split was amicable, and they remained friends and business partners. And Desi told her, time to get back to work. She does. The Lucy Show in 1962 with Vivian Vance. Still Lucy and, and Ethel, or Lucy and Vivian at this point. And the real key to the I Love Lucy show was the relationship between the two women, not between Desi and Lucy. Uh, Desi Lou was on the ropes. Uh, yeah, sure, they were using the studio, but it wasn't bringing in the kind of money that the Ann Southern show was, or guess what, ho, oh, they're both canceled, and they're left with The Untouchables. And The Untouchables was in a dicey situation by 1961 because uh, the Italian Defamation League uh, called up Desi and Lucy and said, listen, you know what? It's not every Italian commits a crime. Uh, so, uh, you know, try to fix that. Uh, and they did, and they lost viewers because of it. Uh, Desi Arnaz proposed to Lucy, get back to work. <laughs> we need to get some money into Desi Lou. Uh, and she does, and she goes to CVS. They go to CVS, and they said, no, 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 no. We, thanks anyway. And she said, wait a minute, I'm Lucy. How much money do I make you? Uh, uh, okay, what do you want? What do you want? Uh, Vivian Vance is going to be my co-star. Okay, we can live with Vivian Vance. Oh, and we want the show on 9 o'clock on Monday. What do you mean you want the show on? No. Well, I'm Lucy, aren't I? Uh, oh, and by the way, Vivian Vance's character, I'm going to be a widower. You're not going to have Desi. She's going to be divorced. She's going to be the first divorced woman on primetime TV. Can't do that. Why not? I just got divorced. People get divorced. So there's another first. Uh, her character, uh, or Vivian Vance's character, was the first uh, on uh, primetime TV to be divorced. And she, there's the sidekick, Vivian Vance. There's Desi Lou Studios, maybe in happier days. Uh, in November 1960, shortly after the debut of the Lucy Show, Desi said to Lucy, Buy me out. She paid her ex a little more than $2.5 million for his 300, 350,000 shares of stock. He resigned. She succeeds him as president. 
first woman to have a major studio, one of the most powerful women in Hollywood. It comes before Betty Friedan releases the book, Feminine Mistake, before the organization, National uh, Organization of Women is formed, before Gloria Steinem goes undercover as a Playboy bunny. Uh, she has broken the glass ceiling. She's the first. Uh, and the hair is red. Uh, CBS didn't want to push color transmission of shows, even though it had the ability to film shows in color since 1951 and had a TV show in color in 1951, 52. During 1963-64, all of Lucy's shows were filmed in color because she thought it would get more money in syndication. Um, that was her idea. CBS finally would show shows in color September 1965. One of the last Ed Sullivan Beatles performances was in 1965 in black and white. Uh, syndication, oh, I love this because I watched the Rocky and Bullwinkle show and elements of that show were taken out uh, to uh, form a show called Fractured Flickers, which was syndicated by Desi Lou Sales. Um, she was pretty okay with all of her executives uh, taking their advice, except for one idea. Uh, they advised her, Mission Impossible, great, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, they did. Uh, during her time as a sole owner, Desi Lou developed such popular series as Mission Impossible in 1966, Mannix in 1967, and that last one called Star Trek in 1966. Well, where no women have ever went before. Hmm. No man, where no man has ever gone before. Where no women have ever gone before. Yeah, you could say that. Because Lucille Ball was the mother of Star Trek. And by the way, the first interracial kiss on TV happened under Lucille Ball's watch between uh, Shatner, William Shatner there, and uh, uh, Michelle Nichols. Uh, and there is a George uh, Take is still around. That's a Shatner who went into space. A number of months ago, if you remember, and Leonard Nimoy. Uh, Leonard Nimoy. Lucy had uh, two show proposals: one for Roddenberry Star Trek, the other for Mission Impossible. It's clear that the Star Trek pilot would be expensive to film. And there was Leonard Nimoy, and NBC happened to like Leonard Nimoy a lot. My friend Shelley Saltman, the late Shelley Saltman, I know is listening right now, and his ears are burning, but he can't get in touch with me 15 years from now, even though he has his uh his burner phone best friends with lenny growing up went to uh, lenny's uh, dad for his haircuts max in the north uh east end of in the jewish ghetto in boston which included leonard bernstein and barry morse david suskind and somebody named baba wawa who shelley assured me had the lisp barbara walters had the lisp in high school it was high school gene roddenberry tells lucy it's wagon train to the stars he wrote on the Wagon Train series. Network TV seemed uninterested in the concept. The Desi uh, Lou board felt the same way. Lucy didn't agree. She greenlighted it. Mr. Spock, NBC wanted to build a show around them. That's what they did. The uh, initial pilot, The Cage Flock. However, uh, NBC ordered the second pilot, which came to be called Where No Man Has Ever Gone Before. They retained Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock, from the first pilot, she said, I'm going to reshoot this. Or the director said, no. She said, I'm Lucy. It's my money. It's going to bankrupt the company. I'm Lucy. It's my money. Well, there you go. Gulf and Western buys out Lucy for $17 million in 1967. Um, it acquired Paramount Pictures at the same time. It was renamed Paramount Television, but today is called CBS Television Studios. Uh, Lucy comes up with uh, a new production company, Lucille Ball Productions, in 1968. Uh, she has a new series called Here's Lucy. The program runs until 1974. Uh, she teaches an eight-week comedy course at uh, Cal State North Ridge. She appears in uh, Maine. Uh, in the, uh, over Desi telling her, don't be in Maine, it's not for you, she does. It's terrible, it's terrible. Uh, but there's uh, Gulf and Western, uh, here's Lucy. Uh, in the 1980s, she's a film producer, All the Right Moves, Tom Cruise, his first big hit, uh, 1983 movie, her second husband, Gary Morton's a producer, in addition to Philip Goldfarb and uh, Stephen Goodrich. 
It's about a high school football player, Cruz, who uh, wants a scholarship so he can avoid ending up like his father and brother working in the steel mills. Did well at the box office. There is one more show she did not know when to get off the stage. 1986, Life with Lucy. ABC wanted 13 shows. They only get eight or put on eight. It's awful. Her last appearance, 1989. She's 78 years old at the Emmys, uh, at the Oscars, rather. She would die a few weeks later. I Love Lucy, and so does Paramount, parent company of CBS. Uh, she paved the way for women to be taken seriously in business in the 50s and 60s. She's the artistic head of Desi Lu. I Love Lucy is still making Paramount money. Uh, decades after its last show aired on May 6, 1957, the show brings in $20 million annually. There is a Lucy and Desi Museum. It's up in Jamestown, New York, and you can go and see uh, sets from the I Love Lucy show uh, recreations, including the New York City apartment and the Hollywood suite, and see costumes and props and Emmys and scripts from the show. And there were two uh, movies this year, one being the Ricardos, uh, which takes place during a week during the production of I Love Lucy. It's actually a compilation where she was pregnant and accused of being a communist. Written and directed by Scarsdale's Aaron Sar uh, Sarkin, he claims he had no idea that she was a communist when he started working on the picture. And Amy Poehler had a picture as well this year, uh, debuted at the Sundance Film Festival, Park City, Utah. It was called Lucy in Desi, about their personal and professional partnership. And Lucy uh, Arnaz uh, gave her approval of Amy Poehler's uh, documentary. She said, I thought, okay, well, don't do that. She was the first woman ever to run a motion picture studio and broke the glass ceiling. Don't do it from that angle, but she hated that. She never wanted to do that. So if you go with that story, it's a fake story. So if you don't tell the story, what story are you going to tell? I had to know what their angle was going to be so it would be authentic and once i knew where they were coming from it was like okay i get that i get what you're trying to do and good luck because that's not an easy story to tell on uh, sirius xm radio um you can hear let's talk to lucy uh it was from her 1964-65 interview show the new show is built from her recordings of conversations from some of the biggest names in hollywood history at that time including Frank Sinatra, a very young Barbara Streisand, her friend Carol Burnett, and Bob Hope. And that's it. Thank you so much. Anybody who loved Lucy who has anything to say, the floor is now yours. And if anyone has questions, they can either unmute or type them in the chat, whichever they like. I'm going to stop the recording. Maybe people will be less shy.